Let me ask you, can a man die twice? That is obviously impossible because that contradicts all we know about life. Meet Clarence Roberts, a man who died in a fire in 1970, only to die again in another fire in 1980. No movie plot. This is a real-life story of a desperate attempt to survive. From the shocking circumstances of his first death to the mysterious second death, today we bring you an unsolved case unlike any other you've heard about. Let's head on over to good old Indiana and learn about Clarence Roberts, the man who died twice. Clarence was born on March 18, 1918, in Brown County, Indiana, as the fifth of seven children. For the most part, his life followed a predictable path. His father, Joseph, was a simple farmer, and his mother, Frances, was a homemaker. Honorably, Clarence served in the U.S. Army during World War II. By 1950, at just 32 years old, he had even become the sheriff of Brown County. At this point in his life, Clarence seemed to have everything a man needed to be happy. Despite his first marriage failing in 1941, Clarence remarried, this time to the young Geneva Roberts. That same year, they welcomed their first child, Bernard. The Roberts family appeared to be the typical American family, a facade that solidified over the years. They eventually had four children, all of whom became upstanding citizens. However, tragedy loomed. The first death, a tragic inferno in 1970. The story kicks off in the scorching summer of 1970 in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. By this time, Clarence Roberts wasn't just the friendly neighbor or former town sheriff anymore. At 52, he had climbed the ladder of success, serving on the board of the Nashville State Bank and co-owning a booming hardware store with his brother Carson. His hard work over 22 years had paid off. He lived in a big house in Nashville, drove three fancy cars and enjoyed the good life. But beneath the surface, things weren't as shiny as they seemed. Clarence had been racking up debt, and as the bills piled up, so did the pressure. Desperate to maintain his lavish lifestyle, he found himself buried in financial trouble. His mood changed drastically, according to his sister-in-law, Alberta Roberts, who said, I really can't describe how different he would be. It's like um, turning a light on and turning a light off. But Clarence's struggles were far from over. His attempts to bounce back by investing in an apartment building and a grain elevator group only pushed him deeper into the financial pit when both ventures failed miserably. Feeling trapped, Clarence resorted to shady tactics, submitting fake invoices to insurance companies. By October 1970, things hit rock bottom. His brother, Sheriff Warren Roberts, repossessed two of his cars, marking the lowest point for the once proud Roberts family. According to Clarence's nephew, Bob White, this financial collapse left his uncle deeply depressed and likely considering a permanent way out. Then came the day of the first tragedy. On Wednesday, November 18, 1970, at 6.27 p.m., just a few weeks after the cars were repossessed, the neighborhood was rocked by the news of a tragic fire that engulfed Roberts's residence. The Nashville Fire Department rushed to the Roberts property. For reasons still unclear, the barn was fully engulfed in flames. This was no ordinary fire. The flames were so intense that firefighters could only watch helplessly as the fire consumed the structure. As they surveyed the scene, the firefighters made a horrifying discovery. Lying among the ashes was a body burned beyond recognition. It was impossible to identify the person, as what remained barely suggested that it was even human. Incredibly, only two items survived the blaze, a ring found among the ashes and a half-melted shotgun found atop the body. 
Jack Bond, the county coroner, was called to examine the victim. At first glance, many in town believed Clarence had taken his own life. The evidence seemed to back that up. The ring on the body was his, and the family owned a shotgun. As 33rd degree Mason, something not many people have, this seemed like clear evidence. However, as Jack examined the charred body, he found no trace of a gunshot wound anywhere, none in the flesh or bones. Then the examination revealed two even stranger facts. The true cause of death was carbon monoxide poisoning, indicating the individual had died from smoke inhalation and the body had actually died before the fire ever started. Then there was the ring. While the fire had melted parts of the shotgun, the ring was strangely intact. This raised suspicions that it might have been placed there after the fire, making people wonder if Clarence was actually dead. The mystery grew when forensic experts discovered the charred body's blood type was AB, while Clarence's military records showed his blood type was B. Adding fuel to the fire, witnesses reported seeing Clarence at a bar in Morgantown just two days before the blaze, where he was spotted chatting with a homeless man. Clarence supposedly offered him a job, but the man collapsed and was taken to the hospital shortly after. Detective Don Custer, assigned to the case, scoured hospitals within a 300-mile radius but found no records of the homeless man. This split the community into two camps. One believed Clarence had died in the fire, while others suspected he had orchestrated the death of the homeless man to claim a lucrative insurance policy. Things took a more sinister turn when it was revealed that Clarence had multiple life insurance policies totaling close to $1 million, all naming his wife Geneva as the beneficiary. But because of the strange circumstances surrounding the fire, the insurance companies refused to pay out. To make matters worse, Earl Bond, the previous county coroner, refused to sign Clarence's death certificate, dragging the Roberts family into a legal battle that only worsened their financial troubles. The case dragged on due to the involvement of prominent figures like Dr. John and a respected pathologist. During the investigation, they both testified that the body found in the garage did in fact belong to Clarence Roberts. I was able to prove to myself and many others that the body in that garage was Clarence, Dr. John confidently stated. Meanwhile, Geneva's life took a drastic turn for the worse. She found herself caught in a downward spiral, much like the one that had entangled her husband before his disappearance or death. The entire incident became the center of gossip in town, and Geneva began to pull away from friends and neighbors. Her finances took a severe hit, forcing her to take a job in the kitchen of a local Howard Johnson's just to survive. But the rumors swirling around Geneva weren't entirely baseless. Some speculated that her job at Howard Johnson's was a cover, a way to make everyone believe her financial situation was worse than it truly was. Local merchants even reported that Geneva had been purchasing large quantities of beer, which seemed strange since she was known to have diabetes and rarely drink. Neighbors also started to whisper that Geneva might not be living alone, claiming they had seen someone lurking around the Roberts property more than once. Detective Dave Anderson received several tips about a man spotted behind the house, trying to stay out of sight. Neighbors described him as someone who looked like he had been cooped up inside and was sneaking out for some sunlight. In response, Anderson and his team set up surveillance around the property for three days and nights. During that time, they photographed everyone who came and went, but found no evidence of the mysterious man. Despite the lack of proof, many in town remained convinced that this figure was Clarence, hiding out with Geneva and living off money stashed away in a secret Swiss bank account. Helen Ayres, a local reporter, 
who had developed a close relationship with Geneva, was also suspicious. She believed Geneva might be hiding something or someone. Every time Helen visited the house, Geneva would meet her on the back porch, never inviting her inside, which was considered odd in their small town where it was customary to invite guests in. This unusual behavior made Helen more curious, prompting her to interview Geneva's sister, Alberta, who lived nearby. Alberta's statements only added to the mystery. She revealed that she had overheard Geneva talking to a man more than once, but the voice didn't sound like Clarence. It was someone else. But who? For nearly a decade, Geneva lived a solitary life, and over time, the townspeople all but forgot the strange story of Clarence Roberts. People moved on, lives got busier, and Clarence's supposed death, real or not, became a local legend, occasionally resurrected in conversations. From time to time, rumors surfaced that Clarence had been seen alive in far-off places like Mexico or West Germany. One of these sightings came from Robert Hillenberg, a former Nashville resident, who claimed to have seen Clarence in Las Palmas, Mexico in 1975. But whether those sightings were real or not, here's where things get really interesting. The resurrection before the second death on November 29, 1980, exactly 10 years and 11 days after the first fire. In a bizarre twist of fate, another fire broke out at the Roberts residence. This time, it wasn't just the barn. The entire house was swallowed by flames. Detective Anderson rushed to the scene and once the fire was controlled, investigators found Geneva's burned body inside. But the mystery didn't end there. As they continued to search the charred remains of the house, a second body was discovered. This one believed to be Clarence Roberts, a man thought to have already died 10 years prior. Dr. Plus, the same medical examiner who had initially declared Clarence dead, was called in again. This time, Dental records and x-rays confirmed the identity as Clarence, revealing the same distinct chest structure from x-rays taken while he was alive. Yet despite this evidence, doubts remained. Many accepted that Clarence had finally died in this second fire, but his relatives were split. Some still believed he had actually died in the first fire, not this one. As of November 2024, it is going to be 54 years since the first fire and 44 years since the second one. Yet the debate continues. Forensics later revealed that the second fire had been deliberately set using turpentine as an accelerant, making it clear it wasn't an accident. The fire began in Geneva's bedroom and her blood alcohol concentration was found to be 0.3%, suggesting she may have been unconscious or incapacitated. Clarence, too, had alcohol in his system, though his level was much lower, at 0.02%. It's believed he was trying to escape, but was overwhelmed by the smoke and flames. Despite this evidence, the mystery surrounding the Roberts' deaths persists. Some believe the body from the first fire was Clarence's, while the second body belonged to a mysterious man neighbors claimed to have seen on the property. Others speculate that Clarence and Geneva were killed that night by an unknown assailant, while some even suggest Clarence himself was the murderer, returning to silence his wife and end things once and for all. There's also the theory that Clarence and Geneva had been working together all along, and the second fire was the result of a final desperate decision to end their ordeal. Whatever the truth may be, the identity of the first victim has never been confirmed, and the full story of Clarence Roberts remains a mystery. In the end, the mystery of Clarence Roberts remains unsolved, leaving us questioning the truth behind his two deaths. One thing is clear somewhere along the way. Clarence Roberts 
made a fateful choice that led him down a path of no return. If you're intrigued by unsolved mysteries like this, be sure to subscribe for more.